So to start talking about Vietnam, we want to make sure we are all comfortable with where it is in the world. Uh, we're looking at, at East Asia and Southeast Asia here. So the country of Vietnam slivers the coast of the South China Sea in what is known as Southeast Asia. If South Asia is like India and East Asia is China, Southeast Asia is right between them. The three countries that we're going to care most about during this next few weeks are the nations of Vietnam, and then just to the west of Vietnam, Laos and Cambodia. All right. I'm going to give you a little bit of background into the early history of Vietnam, only because it, it creates a theme that I think is going to be important throughout the history of the uh, Vietnamese people. You don't need to write this old stuff down, though. You might remember some of it from uh, AP World back when you were a freshman. Going back over 2,000 years ago, uh, the northern portion of what is today Vietnam was conquered by the Chinese Han Dynasty. And so that's going back into the 111 BCE, but you don't care about the years, you don't need to memorize it. Just know that the Chinese took over the northern parts of Vietnam. And over the centuries of, of that invasion and occupation, Vietnamese people will adopt some aspects of Chinese culture but they will also retain a fiercely independent Vietnamese identity. And that will ultimately manifest itself in the year 939 when the Vietnamese push the Chinese out of Vietnam. By this time, we're talking about uh, the, the end of the Tang Dynasty in China. So in 939, Vietnam regains its independence. Now, it doesn't look like, like this is the modern-day country of Vietnam. There were various, there were kingdoms, separate kingdoms in the north and south of Vietnam at this time. But just know that they drove the Chinese out in 939. A few centuries later, Chinese armies again, under the Mongol rule, under the Mongol Wan Dynasty, would again try to invade Vietnam. They would fail. Uh, and Vietnam maintained their independence. By 1516, we get the first Europeans arriving in Vietnam. This is now getting into the age of European exploration. The Portuguese are actually the first Europeans that step foot into Vietnam, but it will be France that will have the most lasting impact on Vietnam. First arriving in 1615 with the earliest Catholic missionaries arriving into, into Vietnam. But later, by the 1800s, when Western European powers like Britain and France started taking over all of Africa, South Asia, Southeast Asia, getting more and more involved into, uh, into China, France would come to dominate what becomes known as French Indochina. So if we take a look at this map, by the late 1800s, we're going to have what is today Vietnam and Laos and Cambodia, all as French holdings in Southeast Asia. That will be, we'll call French Indochina. And the city of Hanoi, which is in the north of Vietnam, the city of Hanoi, will become the colonial capital of French Indochina. Now, from the beginning of French domination of Vietnam, there is going to be a strong nationalistic movement in Vietnam of Vietnamese people who don't want the French to be there. And this is going to follow the similar trends as we see in other countries around the turn of the century. In fact, do you guys remember um, when we talked about World War I, or when you talked about World War I last year, President Woodrow Wilson, to, to try to end the war, came up with a list of ideas called... The 14 points, very good. And um, within his 14 points, there is a strong push to encourage what? Self-determination. Self for people to be able to decide for themselves how they want to be ruled. And according to, uh, now in Wilson's mind, I don't know that he was talking about everybody around the world. He was probably more so focused on people that lived within like the Austro-Hungarian Empire, those Bosnian Serbs, for example, that were nationalistic. But when others around the world are going to start hearing about ideas of self-determination by the President of the United States, they're going to certainly think that means them. And so you're going to see a rise in the early 20th century, whether it be in, in some African colonies like, like in Egypt or in India or in Southeast Asia. 
a push for nationalism, a push for people's self-determination or rights to determine for themselves how they want to be ruled. France was going to see none of this, though. France wanted no part in its colonies having any ability to rule themselves. Now, a little quick comparison between colonies in France and colonies, uh, the colonies of France and the colonies of Britain, because those two countries were the biggest colonial holders uh, of, of any nations in the world. If you had a choice, and none of these people had choices, but Eddie, if you had a choice to be dominated by a colonial power of Britain or dominated by a French colonial power, you would have much rather been ruled by Britain. And one of the best ways to, to show that, to show that in the end it was probably better to be ruled by Britain rather than France if you had to pick one of them, is how all of these nations ultimately got their independence. Because by today, Britain and France have virtually no colonies compared to certainly what they had before the mid-1900s, right? Well, how did those countries become free and independent? Well, for Britain, for example, in Egypt and later in India and then in, in Africa after World War II, you're going to see popular protests and people demanding more self-determination. And ultimately, what does England do to all of their holdings? They leave. They leave. There's no war. Yes, sir? But then there's the partition of India and Pakistan. That was pretty Sure. Yep, but that's after Britain leave. That, that's India and Pakistan dealing with it. Uh, very soon after, but yes. Uh, and I, th I think one of the best ways to, to exemplify that is the idea that during the 20th century, the early 20th century, Britain was, was ruling India with 4,000 British officials and soldiers in the Indian subcontinent. So for, for hundreds of millions of people within a population, Britain was dominating that population with 4,000 Britons. All right? Because they let the people of India largely rule themselves, obviously with British oversight. But they chose local leaders to, uh, to facilitate local community issues. All right? They didn't force wholesale changes or, or domination on the people of India. France is a different story. And when we look at like, the two greatest French colonies, whether we're talking about uh, Southeast Asia here, or in North Africa, the long-held colony of Algeria, how did both of those countries gain their independence? Through horribly violent warfare that lasted for years. All right? France wanted to hold on to those colonies with an iron fist, and they were willing to go to war over it. So the French colonial rule of Vietnam, the French colonial rule of Vietnam was quite harsh. And they allowed very little uh, local say or local autonomy in their rule. Out of that is going to come this man. This is Ho Chi Minh. Now that's not his birth name. Um, like, like many in Vietnam, his birth name, his family name is, uh, is Win. Um, So pretty much half of the people from Vietnam have that as their family surname. Uh, so Ho Chi Minh, that's an adopted name. Uh, and basically, it's, it's a nationalistic name. It, it, in Vietnamese, it, it harkens to uh, independence for the Vietnamese people. So Ho Chi Minh is, in the early 20th century, an advocate for Vietnamese nationalism, for Vietnamese independence. And in 1919, Ho Chi Minh is going to go to Paris, France. Why would anybody go to Paris, France in 1919? Peace Very good. That's where the Paris Peace Conference is being held. And Ho Chi Minh thinks that going to Paris and advocating for Vietnamese independence... Gentlemen, gentlemen, you drive me. Going to Paris and advocating for Vietnamese independence is the best thing that he can do to ultimately get an independent nation. Because Woodrow Wilson is there. And what's Woodrow Wilson been talking about? Self-determination. So Ho Chi Minh wants to be there to speak for the Vietnamese people to let us know and to let the French know and to let the British know that Southeast Asia and Vietnam, they want to and they're ready to be an independent nation. But this obviously is going to fall on deaf ears. Because is the Paris Peace Conference held in Paris, France, going to strip France of its colonial holdings? Doubtful. 
And, and by the same token, Britain in 1919 is not willing to give up their colonial holdings. And in fact, Woodrow Wilson himself is willing to compromise on his own 14 points. Because in order to get an agreement, you might have to chip away at some of the things he, well, he wanted. Remember, a compromise means no one gets really everything they want. What did Woodrow Wilson want more than anything else? What was, what was his greatest hope for a, a resolution for, for future conflict? To get a League of Nations. So Woodrow Wilson is willing to compromise on all of the other principles that he had, like self-determination, in order to get a League of Nations created. In fact, the first ten articles of the, League of, of the uh, Treaty of Versailles that comes out of the Paris Peace Conference creates the League of Nations. So in Wilson's mind, in Wilson's mind, you get the League of Nations, and the League of Nations can deal with all this stuff in the future. But you've got to have the League of Nations first. So Wilson gets his League of Nations. Ho Chi Minh gets nothing. All right? France is going to maintain their colonial holdings. Britain will maintain their colonial holdings. Well, you can imagine how Ho Chi Minh is going to feel after being rebuffed at the Treaty of Versailles, or at the Paris Peace Conference. He's angry. He's frustrated. And what do you think he thinks of the Western powers like France and Britain and the United States? Yeah, we're, we're probably hypocrites in his mind. We talk a good game about self-determination, but we certainly don't allow it for people that look like him. So he starts bumming around Paris, and he goes to cafes, and he starts sitting down and talking with other like-minded individuals who are very frustrated with the ways of the world. And he starts to read some writings of guys like Karl Marx and guys like Vladimir Lenin. Vladimir Lenin, who just had a revolution in, in his own country, right? to bring a new way of, of, of thinking and a new way of, of ruling. Ho Chi Minh will actually become one of the founding members of the French Communist Party. If you guys remember uh, a couple weeks ago, we talked about after World War II, the French Communist Party was, was growing very quickly. And that was one of the reasons that the United States really wanted to start pumping some Marshall Plan money into Western Europe so we could stop that spread of communism into a country like France. Well, Ho Chi Minh became one of the founding members of the French Communist Party. And as now a new communist, Ho Chi Minh would go from France and then to Russia to continue to study and to continue to work for Vietnamese independence. Ho Chi Minh was a nationalist for Vietnam who became a communist. Then World War II comes. In 1940, in 1940, in June of 1940, France, which at this point is, is Vichy France, right? In June of 1940, France will cede control of their colony in French Indochina to Japan, who is now expanding. Now, why would Vichy France be in cahoots with Japan? Well, if you recall, Vichy France was a puppet government of Nazi Germany, and Nazi Germany and Japan had an alliance with each other. They were part of the, what we call the tripartite pact. So France will cede control of Southeast Asia over, and Vietnam over to Japan. Japan will allow French administrators to stay in Vietnam to continue to administer, because France has other, or pardon me, Japan has other things to worry about. So by 1940 and into 41, the citizens of Vietnam, including Ho Chi Minh, now have not only France to contend with, but Japan. And in 1941, Ho Chi Minh will organize what is known as the Viet Minh. The Viet Minh. And you guys have to have these words down, because it's going to get a little confusing. The Viet Minh, which means it, it's the, the League for the Independence of Vietnam. Homegrown Vietnamese fighters who are going to wage battle against the Japanese and the French during World War II. Fighting to get the Japanese out of Vietnam. So the Viet Minh, put together in 1941 to fight against the Japanese throughout the Second World War. 
And the United States is totally cool with this. We like the Viet Minh because, for the same reason that we liked the Soviet Union, right? They were, they were enemies of our enemy. So the Viet Minh fighting against the Japanese was good for us. And we would actually aid the Viet Minh during the, the war in Southeast Asia. Yes, sir? Mm -hmm. that, that's a great parallel. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We armed the Viet Minh. We, we got intelligence from them, and we gave intelligence to them to try to help their fight against the Japanese. We were totally down with the Viet Minh during World War II because they were fighting the Japanese. In August of 1945... Now that the war is coming to an end, remember August of 45, we dropped bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki on August 6th and August 9th. Japan will surrender shortly after. The Viet Minh make a call for a general uprising of the people of Vietnam. They want their own independence. There was little opposition to this uprising. A lot of popular support, people rising up in Vietnam for their own independence, but little opposition to it. Because who was going to oppose it? Well, France, but what is France's condition after the end of World War II? Pretty weak, right? They had been overrun in the Second World War. They were war-torn. Remember, when we liberated France, that involved the United States dropping bombs on French cities in northern France and then driving Germans across the country and out of that nation. France has got problems in Europe that they have to deal with. So they, they don't have a lot of ability to go to Vietnam to quell this uprising. And so by September of 1945, by September of 1945, Ho Chi Minh, seeing little opposition to his popular uprising in Vietnam for their independence, Ho Chi Minh will issue a declaration of independence for the people of Vietnam. And you guys actually have it in your book. So if you want to, but I will read it to you, you can open up your book to page 90, and we're going to read a little bit from Ho Chi Minh's September 2nd, 1945, Declaration of Vietnamese Independence. Page 90. I'm looking at document 4 on page 90. If Ho Chi Minh was an IB student, and Ho Chi Minh had just written his EE, and he submitted this onto turnitin.com, it would probably get him busted for plagiarism. Because he says in his Declaration of Independence, he does cite it, you're right. But not in a formal citation method. Um, all men are created equal, Ho Chi Minh says. They are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This immortal statement was made in the Declaration of Independence of the United States of America in 1776. In a broader sense, this means... All the peoples of the earth are free from birth. All the peoples have the right to live, to be happy and free. The Declaration of the French Revolution made in 1791 on the rights of man and citizen also states, all men are born free with equal rights and must always remain free and have equal rights. Those are undeniable truths, says Ho Chi Minh. He does the exact same thing that Thomas Jefferson does in our own Declaration of Independence. If you haven't read it in a while, you should probably read it like every year or so. It's that good and that worth reading. The Declaration of Independence of the United States is broken into three parts. If you guys remember the first part, that's the uh, we're all created equal stuff, right? That is Thomas Jefferson laying out his rationale. Why are we doing what we're doing? Then there's a big second chunk. The majority of the Declaration of Independence is what? You guys recall this from back in the day? Yeah, it's... Uh, it's as if Jefferson was celebrating Festivus and he was airing his grievances, right? And it's, it's what we call in the Declaration the train of grievances. Because Jefferson said you're, you're not allowed to overthrow or change a government for what he calls light and transient causes, like little issues. So we've got to like, tell everybody why we're doing this. Well, Ho Chi Minh is going to do the exact same here. Nevertheless, for more than 80 years, 
French imperialists abusing the standards of liberty, equality, and fraternity, throwing those words right back at France, right, have violated our fatherland and oppressed our fellow citizens. They have acted contrary to the ideals of humanity and justice. In the field of politics, they have deprived our people of every democratic liberty. They have enforced inhuman laws. They have set up three distinct political regimes in the north, the center, and the south of Vietnam in order to wreck our national unity. They have built more prisons than schools. They have fettered public opinion. They have, uh, to weaken our race, they have forced us to use opium and alcohol. In the field of economics, they have fleeced us to the backbone, impoverished our people. They've robbed us of our, ice fe- our rice fields, our mines, our forests, our raw materials. And he goes on and on and on, listing one after another, making it clear to anybody that's reading this that the French have not been very good to the people of Vietnam. And that if the United States... Ho Chi Minh would argue, if the United States had a right to declare independence in 1776, because if you read the American train of grievances in our own declaration, and you compare them to the Vietnamese train of grievances in his declaration, this is worse. Yes, ma'am. Um, just, uh, I don't have a good answer to that. That's some of this piece of Vietnamese. It, it probably derives from actual words that mean something that I just don't know. Um, so more often than not, you will, usually in, like on our maps, we see it jammed together, but in some writings like this, you'll see it to get separate. Um, his, his grievances are worse. Like, these are more serious uh, arguments against the French colonialists than, than the, the, American, uh, the Americans were dealing with, with the, uh, the British. And so he goes on and does the same thing that Thomas Jefferson says at the end. Uh, For these reasons, we members of the provisional government of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam solemnly declare to the world, Britain, France, America, everybody, that Vietnam has the right to be a free and independent country, and in fact, it is so already. The entire Vietnamese people are determined to mobilize all their physical and mental strength to sacrifice their lives and property in order to safeguard their independence and liberty. How does Jefferson end our own declaration? That all of us signing this thing, we are willing to put our lives and our fortunes on the line to do this. So if you're an American and you're reading uh, Ho Chi Minh's Declaration of Vietnamese Independence, or if you're a Frenchman and you're reading it, you either do one of two things. You support it, or you're what? You're an imperialist, you're probably a hypocrite. You don't really believe the the words that you stood by in the beginning. But, oh, man, the real world is not always in black and white, right? When the Americans hear this, when the French obviously hear it, the French aren't going to be willing to give up their colonies still. And what is the United States thinking in September of 1945? We're worried about the spread of communism. By September of 45, the war is over, but now we know that the Soviet Union has occupied all of the territories that that they have uh, liberated from Nazi Germany. And we know that they've also taken over territories in Asia that they liberated from Japan. We're worried about the spread of communism. Communism at this point stops in East Germany, or in, in the occupied East Germany. But France is right next door to Germany. So is it conceivable in 1945 that France might, under certain circumstances, become a communist nation itself? Absolutely. And that's what our number one concern is. So while it would probably be the right thing for America to do in 1945 to support Vietnamese independence, it is absolutely not what we're going to do. Not because we don't like Ho Chi Minh or anything. We don't really care. We certainly supported them during World War II. Our concern in 1945 is in Western Europe. And we need France to be a strong ally of the United States in the post-war years. Because we have to stop the spread of communism in Europe. So we are willing to sacrifice Vietnamese independence for a strong France after World War II. So we deny Ho Chi Minh his request. Remember, you're not a nation just because you declare your independence, right? We declared our independence from Britain in 1776. Did they give it to us? No. What did we have to do? We had to fight a war, and it lasted for, for seven years, eight years, right? So just because you declare independence doesn't mean you're an independent. ISIS has declared themselves an, an independent state. Does that mean they are? 
No, absolutely not. So you've, to be a state, you've got to be recognized as such by the world. And the United States will refuse to recognize Vietnamese independence. We respect the French right to hold on to Vietnam. And so Ho Chi Minh has no choice for himself but to now fight against the French. So immediately after this call for independence is rebuffed, Ho Chi Minh and his Viet Minh fighters who are still there, remember they just finished fighting the Japanese, they will begin a war against the French imperialists, which is known as the First Indochina War. Now, of course, it's not the First Indochina War at the time because it's like the only Indochina War. But the Second Indochina War, that's the one we get involved in, or we start fighting. The first one was France. So in September of 1945... We've got the beginnings of what we are going to call the First Indochina War. That pits France against Ho Chi Minh's Viet Minh forces. This war will rage from 1945 until 1954. I want you to keep in the back of your mind, though, that the Viet Minh have not been fight. They didn't start fighting in 1945. The Viet Minh had been fighting since 1940, 41, against the Japanese. So 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, France is fighting the Viet Minh in this first Indochina war. And then after 1949, the war is going to change because America's view of the world changes after 1949. The Cold War changes after 1949. What changes are we going to see after 1949? Uh, give me one, Sarika. Okay, the Berlin crisis, the Berlin blockade and the Berlin airlift result in a divided Berlin. And we talked about how that's going to remove the greatest tension in Western Europe uh, of the Cold War. And then we talked about the Cold War now spreading to other parts of the world, like Asia. What's going on in Asia in 1949? Biggest event in 1949 in Asia in the Cold War is? China, China becomes communist. Uh, Mao Zedong's forces, communist armies, win the Chinese Civil War. And on the heels of that, the United States Security Council will issue what? Yes. NSC 68 that says what? That communism is a monolithic force and monolithic force coming out of Moscow. Moscow. That communism is out of, directed by Moscow and directed by Joseph Stalin. And that the United States needs to put more money into our military to stop the spread of communism. Right? And so we start to look at Ho Chi Minh in Vietnam. We'll start to look at Ho Chi Minh, who we might formerly have thought was a, a nationalist who, after World War I, became a communist. Now we start to see him as a communist who happens to be a nationalist. And if he's a communist, and if he's fighting the French in Indochina, and he wins, what happens in Indochina? Vietnam becomes a communist nation, right? And if Vietnam becomes a communist nation, that's another win for the Soviet Union. And we view this guy as being supported by the Soviet Union. Because he is. His armies are being aided by, after 1949, the Chinese and, uh, and the Soviet Union. So now we see it as our responsibility in the Cold War after 1949 into 1950 to support the French in their war against the Viet Minh. By the end of the first Indochina War, the United States is supplying 70% of the money and material that France is using to fight the Viet Minh. It's essentially an American-funded war by 1954, when the war comes to an end. Because we want to stop the spread of communism. Because it's all, ever since 1946, it's been America's policy to what? Communism, to... Contain it. This is all the containment policy. In 1954, in the spring of 1954, French forces are defeated at a northern Vietnamese outpost 
called Dien Bien Phu. You should know that phrase, know that place. Dien Bien Phu. Right up here. The French are defeated at Dien Bien Phu. And it is this defeat, it's kind of like the last stand of France in Vietnam. It is this defeat that convinces everybody involved that the time is right to start to talk about ending this war. The war was hugely unpopular in France. Guys, you can relate to this. Think of how Americans were feeling about American troops in Iraq when we had been there for 10 years. We're ready to be done with it, right? Kind of seeming like it was never going to end unless we just left. The French were feeling much the same in Vietnam. And remember for France, their soldiers had been there from 1945 to 1954. But France was in the World War II for the six years before that. So this has been a lot of conflict that France has been dealing with. They were getting tired of war. The Viet Minh had a, just had a major victory. They were probably at a point in this war where if they negotiated an end right now, that they would get the most that they would ever be able to get. And they're also concerned, the Viet Minh are concerned, about the Americans possibly getting more involved. Because nobody wanted the Americans to enter Southeast Asia. What, according to history, before 1954, might make the Viet Minh think the Americans might get involved in Asia? The Korean War. We already proved that we would send troops to stop the spread of communism in, in Asia. So the Viet Minh could go out on a high note right now. The Americans aren't directly involved yet. And they could maybe get some gains. The Soviets and the Chinese, who are both aiding the Viet Minh, neither of them want a bigger war. The Chinese just got done funding the uh, Koreans and fighting the Korean War. The Soviets don't want any more tension in, uh, in Southeast Asia. So everybody is at a place where they could end this war. So a meeting will be held in Geneva, Switzerland in mid-1954. And what comes out of these meetings are known as the Geneva Accords. Accords are it's just a French word for agreements. The Geneva Accords. And I'm going to lay at you a few things that the Geneva Accords do, and then we will be about done for the day. First, the Geneva Accords in 1954 will end the first Indochina War. The war will be over between France and the Viet Minh. France will grant independence to Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. So the Geneva Accords end the French imperialism in Southeast Asia. The nation of Vietnam. The nation of Vietnam will be temporarily divided. And we know how well temporary divisions in the Cold War work, right? Right? There will be a temporary division between North and South Vietnam. The North will be controlled by the communist Viet Minh. The South will be backed by American and French. The South will be backed by the Americans and the French. But the original plan, according to the Geneva Accords is that within two years, there would be unifying elections in Vietnam. There would be a national election where one leader would be chosen and the country will be reunited. This is an agreement made to kick the proverbial can down the road. Right? Because in 1954, we couldn't hold elections in Vietnam. We didn't feel like we could hold elections in Vietnam. Because if there was a national election for one leader of Vietnam, who were we afraid would win? Ho Chi Minh, the guy that's been fighting for Vietnamese independence for the last 30 years. And if Ho Chi Minh won, that would mean Vietnam is communist, right? And that would be a disaster for us. Yes. 
because that's what they could agree to. This is a compromise, right? Obviously, the Americans and the French don't want this to become communist under Ho Chi Minh. So, and, and the communists, Ho Chi Minh, don't want this to become, they don't want to be ousted. So the agreement that they worked out at the Geneva Accords is that the northern portion, Ho Chi Minh can rule that for the next two years. The southern portion can be backed by the Americans and the French. And in two years, there would be unifying elections. Now, those elections are never going to happen. Spoiler alert. They're never going to happen. We don't want them to happen. Because we don't think Ho Chi Minh, we don't think uh, our guy would win. Ho Chi Minh would probably win which would leave it to be communist. But the only way to get the agreement, the only way to end the war in 1954, was to make this compromise. The South is going to be led by a guy named No Din Diem. And I've got his name written here. That's N-G-O. No Din Diem. It's him. We support this guy to be the leader of South Vietnam. He's a Western-educated Catholic in South Vietnam. In Vietnam, this is going to be important to the story, Catholicism is the largest minority religion. Most Vietnamese were Buddhists, but Catholicism was the largest minority. And there were more Catholics in the south of Vietnam. After the division, this temporary division of North and South Vietnam, when the North will be ruled by Ho Chi Minh's communists, over one million Vietnamese will move from North Vietnam into South Vietnam. I want you to think a little bit about um, the, the issue in Berlin with, with East Germans and East Berliners moving into West Berlin. The majority of this million man movement, and this million refugee movement from North to South, they're mostly made up of Catholics. Catholics in the communist North Vietnam don't want to stay there. Because what is communism's stance on religion? <coughs> it's an atheistic ideology. No religion in, in a communist nation. So most of the Catholics leave North Vietnam. Also, what else happens when, it, when a country becomes a communist country? We talked about this in the Soviet Union. We talked about it in Eastern Europe. What happens to the land? Yes. What's national, we, we've got a better word for it. Yes, sir? Nationalization, nationalization of industry uh, and collectivization of agriculture. So you can have a lot of people who've had family land that has been with them for, for generations and generations. They're going to lose that when North Vietnam becomes communist. And so you're going to have a million people moving from North Vietnam into South, and they're going to swell in the cities of South Vietnam. And guys, think of the debates today about the acceptance of refugees around the world, right? And how challenging that is when we're talking about hundreds of thousands or even tens of thousands of refugees. South Vietnam has got a, hundred, got a million people moving into their country now, from the north, into their cities. There aren't enough jobs for them, right? Not enough housing for them. This is a tension in South Vietnam. So No Din Diem has got a tough job. How is he going to rule this brand new country where not everybody in the South is going to love him, and we'll talk more about that at a later date, with thousands upon thousands of migrants moving to South Vietnam? Diem is going to have a hard time organizing a stable government. He's going to be particularly harsh to his Buddhist population. The Buddhists in South Vietnam are going to feel abused and persecuted. And then, of course, he's got issues with communist sympathizers in South Vietnam that want to see those elections happen, but they'll never come. But we'll talk about that on another day. Good? Good. Questions, anybody? Anybody?